note um, on creativity in arts and sciences. This, uh, we have copies. If you need copies, you can um, I'm not going to um, present this, uh, but just to uh, bring to your attention what we did the last time. <laughs> We have been trying to look at various epistemologies and we came to the conclusion that all sense knowledge is deceptive. That is part of the epistemological findings in Greek philosophy, in Indian philosophy and everywhere in the world in other cultures. So, when the sense perception is deceptive, it creates a big problem for our understanding. Uh, in psychology, uh, we have uh, what is called the uh, Rashmore effect. Uh, in the Hindu paper today, we have a little article on Rashmore effect. You know the, the famous Japanese uh, filmmaker, um, Rosal's uh, uh, film, uh, Rashmol, is, is, is uh, the problem there is one single incident is perceived by different people in different ways. None of them lies. Everybody says the truth according to that person. But the perception is so different one from the other that you cannot decide on the truthfulness of the incident. So this is a problem with the sense perception, uh, which is, uh, in fact, <coughs> um, very much uh, visible in all union scientific disciplines. So what we say there is objective truth in science, but when we come to uh, some of the fundamentals uh, of our perception, we see that it can be biased. So, there is no objective truth, there is no absolute truth. That is perhaps the conclusion the postmodern people took uh, because of the, the relative the understanding of reality. I am not going into that, but we just uh, dwelt on that point. And therefore, we come to the domains of art, science, and religion. According to our popular our normal understanding, these are three ways of perceiving reality. But my point is that there is an underlying common ground, which is creativity, also inspiration. And you cannot distinguish between scientific inspiration, artistic inspiration, mystical inspiration. Well, some of the conservative circles in science, in religion, they may object to that. But it's my conviction that it's a common inspiration. So creativity is something common to arts and science and spiritual pursuits. Um, so I have given a few points uh, on that in this paper which is with you. Um, I just read a quotation from David Edwards, who is a biomedical engineering professor in Harvard. They conducted 10 experiments with remarkable scientists and artists, people with creativity. And the conclusion is this. One of the things that we have seen, we have done about 10 experiments now, is that in the heart of the process of these experiments, it's hard to know who is the artist and who is the scientist. It's a mutually creative and analytical and aesthetic process. He speaks about the cross-pollination between science and arts, which has been going on for ages. It's only during the last few centuries that the academic world distinguished between science and arts, particularly since the time of Francis Bacon and Descartes in the 18th century. Uh, there is another uh, finding from Iowa University where they used 
functional magnetic resonance imaging MRI, functional MRI, uh, they examined the brain activity, cerebral activity in both scientists and the artist when they were engaged in their, in their work. And they have produced the MRI results. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't uh, load it into my computer. It's, it's very interesting. Uh, in, 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 in class A and class B, scientists and artists have the same, almost the same uh, brain stimulation, brain activity, according to the functional MRI. That means their creative process is the same. But the product is different, of course. What scientists produce is different from what artists produce. And there are many scientists and artists who do not arrive at that level. You know the, the case of ECG Sudarshan. Until his very death, I knew him personally, until his very death, he was very agreed that he didn't get the Nobel Prize. His name was proposed several times, and his research was appropriated by a colleague of uh, his, and he got the Nobel Prize, but uh, Sudarshan never got it. So, there is something for luck, you know. If you don't believe in that, you don't know. There is something, the other parameters. So, that's one point. And then this distinction between art and science uh, is an artificial modern distinction. It's very ironical that <coughs> our universities used to provide, even Madras University at the beginning of the 20th century gave BA and MA in sciences. Mathematics or physics, they got BA and MA, Bachelor of Arts and Master of Arts. But the discipline they studied was science. Natural science, inside science. Uh, and uh, again, the irony is that our universities continue to give PhDs. PhD is uh, Doctor Philosophy, Doctor of Philosophy. You may be working in the field of nanotechnology or uh, biochemistry or whatever, but you get you become a Doctor of Philosophy because under the uh, 18th century in Europe. Philosophy uh, embraced all these domains, what we call arts and sciences. Now. So uh, that's part of the uh, heritage. Now, because of the specialization and uh, understanding of science in a special way, we have uh, uh, come to different conclusions. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I think I did not dwell much on this. Uh, what I what to tell you is that no work of art is complete. When I say work of art, it includes a scientific research project as well. Uh, very interesting, I have my artist friends here, Matthew Sorotel and uh, uh, Joseph Kulin, they, they are very good professional artists. When Garay Miravan was working on Akshara Shilpa, in Portail, you know this uh, statue, the huge uh, letter statue in front of the public library. He worked almost two years. And we were there all the time with him, giving him company and learning from him. Um, and he, when it was all finished and he was about to leave, he said, I want to come back. I want to give finishing touches to this uh, artist work. But I am sure he will never come back to do any work on that. For us, the work is complete. The artwork is uh, perfect. But for the artist, he needs more time. I mean, the artist knows it very well. You have, but uh, why do we stop? Because there are constraints. Eh? Uh, either you are tired, uh, or uh, you have to give it to, to somebody, to the editor in time, eh? or your, your sources are over. So there are constraints and that is why you say that the work is over, but the work is not over. I take it as an analogy for uh, the whole created reality. Even not only from a the theological point of view, even from other uh, uh, perspectives, nothing is perfected, but we are in the process of perfecting. Uh, so uh, that is important for artwork. In science, well, you have a scientific project from a university, you have to finish it in one year. The funding is for one year. And you work very hard, 
we finish it in one year. Why? Because funds are no longer available and there is a time constraint. But uh, take the whole research, the brain research, uh, new, uh, neuroscientific work, or uh, work on uh, human longevity, or uh, such disciplines in, in human health, and the work is never finished. Uh, particularly now, we have done the cutting edge of human intelligence. Right? And even if psychologists say that work on human psychology is complete, uh, he, will be, uh, he will make himself a fool. Because now the artificial intelligence opens up a huge universe. And we have no idea where that ends. Probably it's not going to end, it's going to create humanoids, cyborgs, uh, a new species of humanity. Probably this is the end of the Homo sapiens. So that means real research, genuine search for knowledge, whether in art or in or science or in spirituality, there is no end. It continues infinitely. And we have no idea what infinity is at another question. And then I, I finish by mentioning the fact of inspiration. You ask a genuine point to who gets inspiration. Uh, the point doesn't know where the inspiration comes from. Deepu uh, Nirabhi is no longer living. You could have asked him, Deepu uh, how he, he, he writes poems. And nobody knows where inspiration uh, comes from. Uh, but I'm not speaking about all kinds of poems and uh, articles which are given to Vishashalpati in decrease uh, and uh, other publications. No, they are under constraint. But the real inspiration is a mystery. Of course, the, the Greeks and Romans called it the goddess Muse. In India, we call it the goddess Saraswati. In every culture, a deity is named as the source of inspiration. Uh, but it's a mystery. It is, it is taught in uh, the language of uh, mythology. So that much on creativity in the arts and science and religion, I would say. So what I'm in these lectures, I'm trying to uh, discern the common ground, the common roots which connect uh, all these uh, various domains of human life, disciplines, uh, spiritual pursuit, artistic work, and so on. So that much on. Uh, creativity in arts and science. I just want to, before I come uh, come to the, the theme of tariffs, I just want to, some of you are not here last time that I presented it. Uh, you may find it a little bit crazy, but I am uh, crazy about it. Uh, as I told you, this is a plastic. <coughs> Cup, which I collected 30 years ago from Indian brain uh, when they first introduced, 20 or 25, I don't know, when they first introduced plastic cups. And it was written uh, uh, in English, crush it, you know, please deform after use, or please crush after use. Uh, now, we have gone a long way in our ecological sensitivity and understanding. Now we don't say crush it or deform it after use because it can be applied to human beings also, right? to women, right? to children, to weak human beings. Right? It, the same uh, slogan can be applied. So we don't use it. You should be very careful about that. I think Indian railways have changed. Uh, they have now put out uh, a cockups. And you just have service with a smile. Service with a smile. So that's a big change. Now, but still, there is a cultural deformation. What they wrote on this plastic cup, the form after use, uh, has been uh, followed in our modern culture, both Western and culture elsewhere. Uh, so, research. These are the two cups which I showed you last time. Is it okay?
as a pagan idol. Uh, I remember I was teaching in Geneva in the 1980s, and, uh, end of 80s and 90s, and there they brought a huge totem pole from Canada. It was done by some American, some uh, Canadian Indians, American Indians, uh, and it was brought to Geneva with a great effort because they couldn't bring it, of course, uh, by air, they had to uh, bring it uh, uh, to uh, the sea, and of course, Switzerland is a landlocked birthplace, and there is no access to sea. So, it was huge event. And they put it in the campus of the institute where I, I was uh, teaching, uh, but it, they, they were hiding it. There were huge chestnut trees, and in between the chestnut trees, they were hiding it. Because Geneva is a city of Calvin. You know, John Calvin uh, was a great reformer. Reformer and very strict, uh, very much against all pagan uh, representations. So they were, even the city of Geneva, now a secular city, but even the city officials are so scared that in Geneva they have this totem board. But I, as an Indian, I had no problem, you know. Uh, I, I, go to, I take my students to the totem board, they stay there, we, we sit and walk around it. I have a completely different understanding of the totem board as comprising the whole history of humanity, although it is produced by one tribe. Um, and there is no other symbol like that in other cultures, which is, it can summarize the whole of uh, humanity's culture. So, total board, that I cannot uh, uh, find time to go in detail, but I, no, another form of total board. And then, uh, we have uh, the pyramids, uh, the, the famous pyramids. Some of you have already visited it. A huge, the, the, the pictures are going to show the, the real damage. So huge, even marks broke of stone is a huge thing. And of course you can go inside, but creeping, 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 and then you go once you get inside, a huge space, open steam. Uh, but basically, it is a tower. It's a tower. Uh, very precise uh, geometrical, mathematical calculations and the time. The classifications don't give you the real dimensions. Well, uh, this is a mythical image. The mythical image of the, I think, the, the Tower of Babel. You know, the, the first uh, chapter in the first book of the Bible, you have this uh, mythical story of the Tower of Babel. And nobody knows why it is there. Human beings, they built a city and they were so powerful in technology in prehistoric times, and they started building a tower. And then God was so scared that the tower could probably go up to heaven, and he would be dethroned. So God was so angry, he came down, and he uh, used uh, something tactically. Uh, God scattered the language of human beings, because until that time, all human beings who built the tower had one language. They could easily communicate, understand the tower. But when God scattered the language, the building stopped. Because when I asked, as an architect, I asked, uh, bring water, the, the laborers will bring uh, bricks. When I asked for wood, they will bring uh, something else. So the language was so disrupted that the building, the construction of the Tower of Babel was stopped by God. And they, some people say they are trying to uh, look at the source of multiplicity of languages in the world. Uh, so this is a mythical story of the first human effort to build a tower for the Jewish tradition, not only Jewish, Babylonian, Semitic, in general, Semitic tradition. Okay? Ah, okay. <coughs> you will recognize this. You will recognize this. It's not, not there. 
It's not there. In 1978, uh, as, a, as a student, I, I went there and I went up. And I didn't have much money with me, so I had to take the Sada list, you know, ordinary limited stop list. You have to stop in three places and change the list. Uh, there was an express list which goes directly uh, from the ground floor to the top. And then, uh, well, I, 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 was, I marveled at this great creation of humanity, but some of them there, none of them there. And some wise human beings, I don't know whether they are Americans or not, they called the ground, ground zero. Ground zero. Every time I go to near, I think that Sometimes ago it was a huge pitch, but now they have a little better now. But I always admire the person who called it ground zero. And when the new, that's a new tower from like this, and it was being built, uh, they had a huge, uh, the right, uh, yeah, the right of the uh, this is probably the spirit of the dead uh, World Trade Center. Uh, that was in a way fascinating, but it was also sad. And that the material thing is no longer there. And it's sad. But the proud town is gone. But instead you have a beautiful rainbow uh, light beams going up into the sky. Uh, well, uh, I, I want to say again that this tower is not a not the expression of a tribal sense of unity, of oneness of humanity, not just town of pride. Because Americans are so confident, Americans were so powerful, uh, they had a global empire at that time in the 1960s and 70s, and they thought they have come to the top, so they built this tower as a tower of arrogance, pride, uh, and self-confidence in the uh, small way for that. Okay? And there was something else before that? Actually, this is a work of art. Uh, some of you probably know the name of uh, Rambusi. Rambusi is a Romanian artist sculptor. Uh, personally, I like his sculptures very much, but I only uh, took one, one example. This is a uh, work of art. It's not for any purpose here. It's not for any, any flag hoisting or for anything. Just a work of art. But this was repeated many times in various versions with uh, different materials. So Brandis is uh, oh, uh, sculpture. Yeah, again, the Eiffel Tower. <laughs> Eiffel Tower, uh, Mahatma Gandhi was so critical of the Eiffel Tower when it was built at the end of the 19th century. There was a world exhibition in Paris, a trade exhibition. So it was the first time that they were using cast iron. Cast iron was uh, discovered, it was produced, and so they used cast iron uh, for the structure. They called the artist uh, insane, mad architect. His name is Efer, but the tower has the same name, Efer. E I F E L. Efer was actually crazy, mad. But now, of course, it has become the symbol of uh, Paris. Uh, but it doesn't serve any any purpose except that it can serve as a uh, uh, tower for uh, mobile phones and other uh, transmissions. Again, towering. This is uh, this <coughs> this smoke screen uh, towers. At one time, at the beginning uh, of the 19th century, even the 20th century, yes, they were very proud 
symbols of progress of the industrial revolution and uh, of great uh, development. Uh, uh, I recently discovered a little speech I prepared uh, as a student in the SP called the age of 17. And in that, you know, there's a type of Jero La Jero, um, so uh, industrial revolution uh, was a great thing for us. And, uh, and I, when I read that speech, I'm ashamed that uh, as a young man, that was the impression I got, that these uh, smoky chimneys are the symbols of the progress of a nation. That is the identity God, but that is completely no. Yes, this is the
tree. The tree is again a town. And this is a basic symbol. This basic symbol is from nature a town. This the tree is a town. Uh, this is Mount Kailas. In uh, 2012, I had the great uh, privilege <laughs> to be there at the foot of the Mount Kailas. Uh, again, it's a tower, sacred tower. Uh, this is a Sigura. This is a reconstruction of the ancient Babylonian Sigura, the high place for worship. Uh, you know, when the, you know, the, you know, the side of the Euphrates and Tigris is not mountainous, but uh, we have these, these high structures for worship and also as a, as a symbol of the uh, cultural maturity. Uh, cultural. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, I said these tablets are ambiguous. Uh, the, the negative aspect of it we have seen the World Trade Center. And in fact, all these new tablets which are being built in Dubai, in Saudi Arabia, in, uh, in Malaysia, uh, in uh, you know, this they have the same fate, we do not know. And it may trouble at some point in history, in a dramatic way, we do not know, let it not happen. So, because these, some of these things are built as the outcome of human uh, arrogance, self-confidence, uh, and even uh, right, yes. But on the other hand, humanity has an aspiration to go higher and higher and higher. Uh, because this is the inbuilt spiritual dimension. I don't call it spiritual in any religious way, no, but uh, it is congenital for humanity. It is endemic in our nature that we want to go up. The first thing we want to do is wait. You know, you look at the streets in the morning, people are uh, running, you know, jogging, you know, they go to gyms, the yogas. Most people want to reduce their weight. I go for yoga, I also want to reduce my weight. And what is the meaning of reducing weight? You can levitate. You can lightly go up. Then I lose complete weight, then I will even Stephen Hawking, you know, this uh, great scientist who was chained to a, a motorized wheelchair, uh, he had such speculative theories about the universe and he wanted to know, experience, what is weightlessness. Because he spoke about it a lot and he didn't know what it was. So they took him in a, in a plane and the plane went up, up 35,000 uh, 35, feet and then suddenly it fell. It fell. And then uh, he felt, he understood what weightlessness, but of course people were uh, arranging things for him. But it is, it is not uh, uh, injured. So, weightlessness is something we all need. And take all spiritual exercises. Uh, go to the Himalayas, go to Christian churches or Islamic places of worship. Uh, people are doing asceticism, fasting, exercises in order to lose weight. The spiritual counterpart is that you are able to fly like an angel, you know, uh, so without being. So the towers symbolize the human aspiration uh, to, to leave the earth or to become so light that they discover their spiritual dimension with what they call the soul or the spirit. Uh, so this is the uh, spiritual interpretation which we can give. On the economic side, of the political side, you see the towers coming up as the outcome of a human uh, self-confidence or the rest states. Uh, so it's always ambiguous. But in between, in between, they have high places, uh, small hills where you can go up, you can sit, you can look at uh, the horizon around you, you can also meditate, you can talk to each other. Uh, so it is in between. It's not earthly, neither it is not uh, heavenly. 
but in between. Again, that expresses the human need to rise above the ordinary, the routine, the, the quotidian, the quotidian, the routine, the ordinary, so depressing sometimes. You, know. you want to escape, you want to get away. Uh, nowadays, people speak about it openly, oh, I have worked so hard now, I want to get away. You know. And people go for holidays, but in old times, they, they couldn't do that. They couldn't go for holidays. Um, they found their own inner space. And that also is possible. You can create inner heights within you. Without moving, <laughs> without uh, going, you can create inner heights. Now, the towers are so uh, ambiguous in their meanings, but still, we need towers. We need uh, high places. We need elevation. We need points from where we can see the whole universe in a different way. That perspective is important for art, for science, and for the human Uh, is lifted up 
So in the in the in the, in the steeple of this piece of wood, as it goes up, goes up in the, into the air, and you don't see, you don't see the tip. It's so subtle. So that's why I put it in in white. You didn't put any color on that. And it is a white background. You can see actually, and that is precisely that. That it should be so subtle that it merges to the background, to the sky, and you don't see where it ends. So altogether, uh, it's an installation which conveys some something. Uh, but I need to. I need to fix it in a in a better way. Uh, I think I gave you some uh, some information on this. It is also the painting they they recently did. Uh, I don't repeat what I said on on this mask, but. Now assume that we are in a room. We are in a room, uh, and there are no windows or doors. Uh, you are in that light, of course, but you are in a confined place. But suppose your your room is so big, say 10 kilometers uh, wide and uh, long, you don't see the outer walls. You think you are in open space, but in what 10 kilometers you see huge walls and no open. So I am suggesting that sometimes human condition, human condition is like that. Uh, we have a space of you don't realize that we are in a confined place. Uh, but there are people, artists, some creative people, some spiritual people, they can sense, they are so sensitive they can sense this confinement that we are in a, uh, in a in a very narrow space. What do they do? They are choked, they are spiritually oppressed, so they create. They create and they, they make a painting and they put it on the wall and then people come and see the painting. They knew that this place was closed but in the painting it opens up a new horizon. In the universe, and yeah. I'm, I'm not an artist really. I have great artists, but with their permission, uh, I will just uh, look at this. This is a tall feet here, uh, and the walls. You can see uh, You cannot break it. You can see the outside. But then I put it here. Right? You spend one minute. Forget all about this. You forget all about that and you have the horizon. You have the sunset or sunrise, whatever. And you have a different uh, experience of the universe. So this is what artists and good scientists, creative scientists, they also do the same thing. You know, well, it's not uh, inventing an atom bomb or a nuclear missiles, but uh, more than that, they open up, they cut open the windows, I mean the, 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 the walls, the high walls, and then they open a new universe for us human beings. I think that is the same part of art. I'm not uh, giving a message to you as a spiritual message, but this is my experience, you know. My experience is that when you are in a confined space with the no doors and windows, art saves you. A genuine search for knowledge saves you. Uh, so good scientists, good artists, good spiritual people, uh, any creative person in the world, in any domain, they can open windows for you. And we need such people and we need to be aware of that. That is a new sensibility we need to develop uh, for the future of humanity. Thank you.
വരെയാണ് കാലിൽ പോകാനായിട്ട് ഇപ്പൊ നമ്മളെ ഈ കാലം മാറി മാറുമ്പോഴത്തേക്ക് ഇന്നത്തെ ഒരു സാഹചര്യം എന്താണ് ഈ ക്രിയേറ്റിവിറ്റിയെയും ഒക്കെ ഇന്നത്തെ ഈ ടെക്നോളജി ക്രിയേറ്റിവേറ്റഡ് മാർക്കറ്റ് പോകും അപ്പം അച്ഛനീ പറഞ്ഞ അച്ഛൻ അവസാനം പറഞ്ഞ അതിൻ്റെ ഒരു സ്പേസ്
നമ്മുടെ മോഡേൺ സിവിലൈസേഷൻ്റെ ഏറ്റവും വലിയ പ്രോബ്ലം ആയിട്ട് ഞാനത് കാണുന്നു ലിറ്ററേറ്റ് അവർ കൾച്ചർ ഹാസ് ബിക്കം സോ ലിറ്ററേറ്റ് ദി ഹാവ് ബിക്കം ലിറ്ററേറ്റ് ലിറ്ററലായി പോയി വി ഹാവ് ബിക്കം സോ ലിറ്ററേറ്റ് അതിൻ്റെ കുഴപ്പമില്ലാന്ന് ചോദിച്ചാൽ ഈ സിമ്പിൾ സ്വത്ത് മനസ്സിലാകുകയില്ല ഞാനിപ്പോൾ ഈ ടവറെ കാണിച്ചത് എന്തിനാന്ന് ചോദിച്ചാൽ ടു ബ്രിങ് ഔട്ട് ദി സിമ്പിളിസം ദി ടവേഴ്സ് ഇത് നമ്മൾ സാധാരണ ഗതിയിൽ അതിൻ്റെ കാണുകയില്ല അപ്പം സിമ്പിൾസ് ഇമേജസ് മെറ്റഫേഴ്സ് മനസ്സിലാക്കാൻ കഴിവ് നമുക്ക് നഷ്ടപ്പെടുമ്പോൾ ഇതിൻ്റെ ഒരു ടെക്നോളജിക്കലി വെരി അഡ്വാൻസ് ഇക്കണോമിക്കലി വെരി പ്രോഗ്രസീവ് ബട്ട് വി ആർ നോട്ട് ഇൻ ദ റൈറ്റ് ട്രാക്ക് ആൻഡ് ഒരു <laughs> 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 <laughs>